Hello and welcome. While disappointingly, domestic violence has always been an issue in Australia and all around the world. And while the stay at home era has um, been a wonderful time indoors with loved ones, it hasn't necessarily been the case for those who are victims of domestic violence. You know, if anything, the COVID-19 era has become a breeding ground for it and made many more vulnerable than ever before due to the pressure cooker that has become their own household. Now, for many households and, for, and, and women who were already ex experiencing domestic abuse before the pandemic, the news as we were heading into lockdown restrictions really was worst news imaginable. So as we start to phase out of the lockdown now, uh, domestic violence is a subject that we really need to be speaking about more in the hope that anyone that has suffered feels supported and knows where and how they can seek the help that they need. And to do this today, we welcome our special guest, Dr. Love, a psychology expert specialising in relationships. And with many of her clients experiencing domestic violence, Dr. Love will talk to us today about the fears um, around personal safety for anyone who has suffered abuse during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm very well, thank you. Trying to navigate my way through this as well. Mm, I know it's been an extremely difficult time for everyone and and this is really a difficult subject to to speak about so trying to keep it as light and breezy as possible but at the same time really communicate um, as many of these key messages as we can now firstly for anyone um, that's sort of listening and watching can you just start just by defining exactly what domestic violence is. Now, is it restricted to physical abuse only? Um, or if not, I mean, what other sort of level of abuse could, um, could be included under the definition, I, I guess? This, this actually is something that um, we overlook around domestic, domestic violence. We just assume that it just means someone's going to be walking around with physical signs of abuse, you know, scratches, bruises and so forth, but that's actually not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, domestic violence and family violence can look anything around um, like physical violence. It could be sexual um, violence. It could be emotional, social, financial um, abuse, spiritual abuse. So there's a lot of uh, variations to what domestic violence could look like. Yeah. And, you know, COVID-19 has put everyone under an incredible amount of strain and pressure these last few months. Um, and we've all had moments of like meltdowns for one reason or another. <laughs> However, I guess when it comes to an abuser on any given day, they don't need an excuse to have a meltdown or to inflict abuse um, on their victim, let alone, I guess, you know, having the reason of a pandemic and everything that we've just gone through, um, which really has caused countless pressures, including financial, you know, economic pressures, yeah. um, you know, living, working, schooling under uh, one roof, um, all the different things that we know of. So, in your, you know, from your opinion, you know, what effects um, would the pressures of COVID-19 have actually had on, on an abuser? Um, you know, understanding well, that they on, are have, sort of bit more. Have, on, have, on, have on the victim maybe. Um, so what's actually happened is that normal in a normal case scenario, um, the victim sort of finds solace in the ability to either leave the home, go to work, mm -hmm. um, if it's a child, go to school. And so that ability to uh, get some respite actually had disappeared with the COVID. You know, mm -hmm. they were forced to be in that space with the abuser for a lot longer than they had ever been. And what that did, it actually, um, they're, quite, they're quite vulnerable. And so what they needed to do is find a way to navigate their way through to keep themselves safe while they're actually in a home with this person 24 hours a day. So we were seeing quite uh, a huge, uh, I know for myself with my client, you know, the risk factor of them not being able to get respite while they were in a home was quite dangerous for their mental health and some of them for their physical safety. Hmm. So in your opinion, how has this time, I guess, of self-quarantine um, impacted the increase in domestic violence then? Well, well, we've, we've probably seen an increase in um, some of the reporting, but we may not, we may not have as well, because some of the times um, 
there's, there's something going on here. So the victim may um, be reporting what's going on for them if they get a chance to, but when they're in a home for 24 hours a day with the perpetrator, that becomes quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got the notion of being, you know, locked in a home or in lockdown and we're not leaving the home. So normally a lot of the reporting comes from a third party. Yes. And what you'll see is that, you know, children attend school and they start to, um, you know, teachers and welfare officers notice that there might be some physical abuse. You know, the child's a little bit um, withdrawn. It looks like there might be some neglect, um, you know, malnutritioned or, you know, a parent notices another parent not, not um, you know, with physical, a physical indication to say that something's gone wrong. And so we removed the ability uh, for people to report. So although there was some reporting, I feel like it's probably been a little bit of, um, we've been under reporting at the same time. So people are saying, you know, the lines are going crazy, you know, domestic violence has surged. Well, that might be the case, but I still don't feel like we know the real numbers because we've lost a real chunk of, you know, the people in the community that would be doing the reporting, the mandatory reporters that would help yes. the victims in that situation. Yeah. You know, and as a relationship expert, you would be um, aware more than anyone else that during the lockdown families would have experienced um, many pressures for the very first time. Um, and abuse may be something that um, has resulted from just the pressures associated with the pandemic. Um, so what advice do you have for someone in, you know, that, that situation at the moment that has experienced abuse, but for the very first time as a result of just these pressures? So when an individual is experiencing abuse for the first time, it's a real shock because they have known an individual in a relationship as a particular way and an interaction in a relationship. So there's, there's almost like a grief or a mourning, but there also is with the shock, it's, oh, you know, this has never happened before and I'm sure it won't happen, happen again. You know, there's almost that, he, you know, he or she might be really stressed out at the moment because of what's going on and their behavior is not as it was um, you know, prior to the pandemic. So the extra stresses. So we need to be a bit careful here because sometimes we can actually make a bit of excuses around people's bad behaviours when, you know, our things aren't the same as what they used to be. So, um, you know, being in a situation where it's the first time is really a red flag at, you know, straight off the bat. Whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, it is a time where um, it doesn't need to break the relationship. I'm not saying that if there's a, you know, the first instance of domestic violence, you need to pack your bags and run away. That's unrealistic. Mm. Because, especially if it's a one, you know, a one-time occurrence. Um, sometimes people are pushed to the brink and we're seeing this in the media. You know, we're seeing violent acts in, you know, our shopping centres and in our aisles. We've never seen behaviour like that before. Mm -hmm. So real desperation and coming from a place of fear. Yes. And you can see that, that we will all also see this in our relationships is that unfortunately that we, some of us won't have all the resources we need to be able to deal with some of the stresses that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest is that if you're experiencing anything like this, that is out of the ordinary for your relation, relationship is to really seek some help. Mm -hmm for both of you, because you can navigate your way through this, but because it's foreign to the relationship and you haven't experienced anything like this before, you're going to struggle to work out how to navigate successfully because mm -hmm. it could deteriorate the relationship. It could be the, the, the tipping of the relationship falling apart. Yes. So what about neighbors, yeah. friends and family, you know, as, um, the lockdown restrictions are beginning to lift, you know, what do you suggest someone should do if they find out or suspect that a loved one um, has been a victim of abuse um, sort of during sort of lockdown? Um, yeah. yeah. So neighbours are quite um, an asset for those people that are in, you know, domestic violent relationships and um, they are a little bit isolated from probably family and friends. And I've, I've just been speaking to a woman, a client of mine, and she's actually in Melbourne from where you are. And 
but she's originally from Sydney and the lockdown really suffocated her and she was experiencing a domestic violent relationship and it was just, it was sexually violent actually. And mm. it became increasingly, um, you know, the occurrences of that became, was increasing through COVID and she was isolated because her parents couldn't come down from Sydney. Her friends couldn't see her. They, she couldn't be, she wasn't spending time away from the home mm -hmm. and her neighbors were quite a, um, an asset to her through that process. They really, um, they looked out for her. They would check on her every once in a while. They would notice when he went to work, they would come over and say, Hey, do you need anything? Um, but then she was also put herself in a position of being honest to them. So this is what we're finding is that not a lot of people like to talk about any type of violence in the home because they're ashamed or there's a guilt or mm -hmm. they're embarrassed by what they're going through. So they suffer in silence. So, you know, if you are experiencing any violence and you are worried for your safety or you're not sure of the repercussions of being in the home, it might be a good idea to let your neighbor know, hey, if you hear anything out of the ordinary or if you feel like um, you're hearing an argument or things, you know, crashing, I give you permission to call the authorities or I give you permission to call someone because I might be needing help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might even develop a type of system where a plan where you've got a code, you know, you dial their number and hang up and, um, you know, the neighbour knows if you've dialed and hung up that they need you to, you need them to come and knock on the door to sort of almost intervene when things are getting a little bit too heated or yeah. when you're feeling a bit fearful. So it could be part of the plan, but you know, our neighbors and our family are a great asset when we're going through domestic violence. So I think more than anything, the message is if you are going through it is don't be ashamed to talk about it because it's the only way you're going to get the support that you need. You can't do it on your own. Yeah. And in saying that, you know, during the last um, eight weeks in, in, it's really interesting that there has not actually been an increase in calls to help lines and there was not an increase of cases being reported to authorities, as you mentioned before. Um, and this was because the victims had little access to resources um, and were, were restricted from seeking healthcare professionals and or just, you know, a lack of visibility in the community around them. Um, you know, the majority of violence during COVID-19 has been undetected. And you mentioned that earlier on as well, um, which means that, you know, that they, they weren't being reported to authorities. So I'd love to know if someone has experienced abuse during lockdown um, and hasn't reported it, um, you know, like, like where do they start? Well, they can still report it. I mean, abuse, just because it doesn't happen today or it didn't happen yesterday doesn't mean it didn't happen. Mm. Um, and so there's, there's a process in that though. Um, obviously there's the reporting and then there's the giving of statements and then there's possibly what they call, um, you know, a apprehended domestic violence order. So there's a process that they go to, to keep you safe, the authorities. Mm -hmm. um, but the first point of call really is if you are harmed or you're feeling like you are physically unsafe is to work out, um, is it safe enough to go? And unfortunately, that's sort of the position that people are in is that um, if they leave prematurely without thinking of their safety or a plan, it could be detrimental to their safety. Yes. Um, it could do the opposite to what they're trying to achieve. And we have seen this multiple um, times in the media and we only hear of some of them and they're just the ones that were quite, you know, overtly displayed in a street or a lot of people seem to witness what was going on. But you know, the consequence of, you know, I say women, but it happens to women and men. But um, for, in my instance, I, I speak to a lot of women in this situation that the planning and the way they do get some support is really important, especially when it's around physical safety. And, you know, it, a lot of the abuse can start with things like emotional abuse and mm -hmm. spiritual abuse and financial abuse, and then it just can escalate. Um, so some of those, those, although they're not, they're, they're serious, but it sort of has like a stepping escalation of, you know, before it was sexual abuse, but now I'm walking around with bruises on my body. So it's escalated to the next level. Um, so the planning is important, really important in situations like that. Mm. 
Um, as you mentioned before, you know, a large majority of family violence cases are reported by early educators and school teachers because um, it's mandatory for them to notify the authorities um, yeah. about children who are being abused in the home. So, you know, with the phasing back um, and the return to school, do you, as you know, I guess your opinion, do you think that teachers may see an increase in cases at all? Look, I think educators and welfare officers will be um, asked to look for signs that maybe there's something going on because we haven't, Mm. Although we've had some online school learning and there's been quite an absence of face-to-face -face with these children. And unfortunately, the reality is school sometimes is the only safe place for some of these kids. Um, it's the only place they go to get respite. That's where they go and they know that they're going to be safe. They're not going to be harmed. They can take a breather. They know that they're going to get fed food at recess and lunch because if they don't come with food, the school will provide it. So in my opinion, it probably, you know, the school welfare team would definitely be looking for signs because it's, it was, you know, normally the school is the first point of contact for these kids to make sure that they're okay. And also the parents that are doing the drop off. How does mum look today? Um, you know, what is dad doing? Do they look a little bit disheveled? What's their behaviour? So people start to notice. So I do think there might be an increase to authorities. Um, I hope there is because um, that's the only way we can sort of support these people that are suffering in silence. Mm. <clears throat> and one of the questions we hear all the time, time and time again, is, you know, why doesn't she just leave, you know? And I guess we need to stop blaming survivors for staying um, and really start supporting them. Um, but I'd love to know, like, why do so many victims of abuse stay? You know, Rachel, this question makes me feel so sad it's almost like we're blaming the victim for staying. It's like almost their fault. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case at all. You know, victims stay for a number of reasons. And a number of reasons, no, if you haven't been through it, you just don't understand. Like some of it might be financially, they know that they don't have the financial means and they haven't planned enough to be able to, you know, financially um, support them and three kids that they need to leave the home with. And so they feel stuck. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it was like I was speaking to you, um, I mentioned earlier, sometimes leaving is the most dangerous thing to do if not done right. Yes. Um, and that's where we start to see the most um, homicide rate is when women, it, it's, it's after they leave the relationship, not necessarily in it. Mm -hmm. It's when they leave their partner and the partner comes hunting them down because it's how dead, like they have this right over them in the relationship and ownership. So, you know, if you can't, if I can't have you, no one will, and it sends them crazy. So we've seen a lot of that happen. So there's a lot of fear that's been put into these, um, you know, men and women, but in my case, a lot of women, and they feel stuck. And so, and it, that, it's not until they really make the decision that they're done. So they will put up with so much but until they are actually mentally and emotionally ready to make the decision to say, I'm out of here and get the support, make sure they've got the plan, they won't do it. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is offer them the resources to make those decisions quicker. Rather than say, why are you staying? Saying, what do you need? What do you need to be able to navigate your way out of here when you're ready? How can, how can I empower you? How can I give you the resources? Where can I point you? Rather than why are you staying? He's treating you like this or he's doing that or she's doing that to you. Why are you there? Mm -hmm. That's un, that's an, it's an unfair call. Mm -hmm. That's like saying to someone, I'm going to chuck you in the pool and you can learn to swim on your own and you've never been to a swimming lesson in your life. That's what you're doing to these people is that we're chucking them into a real unsafe zone where they'll drown. So they will either come back to shore, which is come back to the relationship because it's the only way they know to survive mm -hmm. or they will have the means and had the lessons and got the resources to float their way out of the relationship. So we need to support um, them with the resources and everything else. We have yes. to support them. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. You know, and one of the most common reasons, um, as you just mentioned, why domestic violence ends in serious injury and in some cases as you mentioned domestic homicide was is because the victim 
um, was separated um, from that person. So, you know, besides giving them the support, is there anything else that we need to be able to, you know, um, have implemented into the system to stop it? Um, and, you know, what else, what else can we be doing? Is there anything or not? Well, Rachel, I do, I see a real big gap between when the woman reports the incident and leaves the relationship, there is such a lag in our justice system to put them behind bars for breaching an AVO order. Mm. They are, they are put back on the street. They are, you know, very easily, even if they're breached, they let go. And so the woman is still in fear for their life. So there is a lag between the woman leaving the relationship, the partner breaching the AVO, and the woman then needing to decide, is it safer to go back because he keeps breaching but doesn't get locked up or doesn't get a consequence for the behaviour? Mm -hmm. He gets bail or he's out. Um, you know, out on bail until the court case and the court case could take another six months. And so she's at risk for six months while he's out on the street. And so we are not, I think we could do that better. If we could close the gap between the offence, the woman reporting and the perpetrator being, um, having a consequence, we will see less women go back and we will see less women be hurt. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, we are leaving them vulnerable. And this is why they're going back is because I can't run away. I can't hide. I don't feel safe for the next nine months because no one has, you know, protected me here. I have mm -hmm. an AVO, but what does that mean if you can breach it and still come out and do it again and yes. have multiple breaches. Yes. So I don't feel safe. So the AVO really doesn't make me feel safe. I was safer in the relationship, although unhealthy. I knew I was going to stay alive. I'm going back. Jeez Louise. Yeah. So I think that's where we can improve is between the reporting, the, you know, domestic violence order taken out and, you know, the perpetrator really being detained so that, the woman doesn't feel like they need to run back for safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess this whole COVID-19 era isn't over just yet. So generally, do you have any tips for families, how they can stay safe from domestic violence like during this time? Because we're still in it. Yeah, <laughs> we are in it. Thank goodness we're loosening up some of the restrictions. And I think one of our saving graces is that most of the states and the governments have, um, suggested that children go back to school. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be, I think our schools and our teachers and our welfare officers are really going to be a people of contact mm -hmm. for those in domestic violent relationships. They are going to be the safe people that mm -hmm. they come to. Um, so people that are in a domestic violent situation at the moment, I would suggest use the resources at the school if you need to. There is mm -hmm. welfare officers, there are counsellors, you can talk to the school principal and they can do whatever you need for support from there because if you don't feel safe at home, at least you feel safe there to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you will start to see that some um, occupations will go back into whether it's the office or wherever it is. And so you, you might be one of the lucky ones that gets some respite or some solace in the fact that your partner or the perpetrator now is leaving the home. Yes. And that will give you an opportunity to get your own, your own type of um, support. So make the phone calls, there's free services, get educated around what you can do. You can't guess in this situation. You really need to explain it to a professional. This is what I'm going through. This is my risk. And you need to say, what are my options? And find, it out, find out what your options are. Uh, not to mention that you probably need some um, support around your mental health and just keeping you mentally, um, your mental health and your, your psychological safety mm -hmm. um, while you're doing the planning is really important. So use your schools, use um, some of your health professionals, jump onto telehealth, jump onto any of the online services that we have right now. You've got places like Black Dog, you've got Lifeline, you've got Beyond Blue, any of those services that can help you in the moment, just talk about it. Let your neighbours know, 
There's no shame in it. You're not doing anything wrong. If anything, you're doing the right thing to say, hey, I need a bit of help and that's okay. Mm. How about um, having a safety plan in place? What are your thoughts with that? Yeah, that would go back to make sure that you've got that plan. So whether it's, you know, financial safety, do you need to have a piggy bank before you make the move? Do you need to, um, you know, construct a plan to actually take, I hate saying this, but almost run away from the home and without the perpetrator knowing because it's not safe? And do you need to let a woman's shelter know that, hey, I need a bed for the night for me and my, you know, two children so that we're safe? Because they've got those services. If you need a bed and if you need to go somewhere that is safe, they will give you that. They've got emergency housing and, you know, God love all those people that are out there doing that work for those women. But there are those services there. So the, that is the plan is, you know, you might need to have a friend or a neighbor that is, um, that has a, a code. Do you ring and um, hang up or do you send a text that says, you know, um, did you get the goofy doll? And that means call the police, whatever it is. It's like a trigger word, a safety word, send it to someone. Um, that is all part of your plan. And a professional can help you do that. If you're in the midst of um, the overwhelm of a domestic violent relationship, sometimes that plan sounds overwhelming mm. um, on top of what you're going. So a professional will help you navigate yeah. through that and come up with a realistic plan, not something that's going to get you into probably more trouble than you are already. How else can they take care of themselves also? Because that's really important. And their mental health. You know, Is there anything really else that they can be doing? really hard in a um, domestic violent relationship because it starts to chip away at your self-esteem and your self-worth without you even realizing it happens. And then you look back and you go, what happened to me? You know, I'm not who I used to be. So it's really important to do all the little things that we encourage around self-care whenever you can. Going for your walk, going, you know, make sure your nutrition is good keeping up your water intake, getting sleep. And I know sleep can be a problem for people that are in a, um, you know, a toxic relationship because some of them have anxiety, you know, or they're having nightmares or they're having, um, you know, night terrors around the relationship. So I get that. But see your GP and mm -hmm. talk to them about it. Like they're your first port of call. And most people have access to a GP. Tell them what support you need. Mm -hmm. So really important is that our basic needs are met. We haven't met our safety needs. We all deserve, um, that is one of our primary needs is to feel safe. But food, water, you know, I know that um, some of the people that I speak to um, listen to podcasts or um, apps that can help around, you know, meditation, um, you know, affirmations, anything that's going to remove almost distract your mind from thinking of the toxicity you're in mm -hmm. because thinking about it isn't going to take it away. No. So what you need to do is acknowledge it. Don't ignore it because ignoring it mean, puts you in a very vulnerable, unsafe situation, but acknowledging it and saying, okay, it's not helpful to sit in and wallow in it. What do I need to do to build myself up? So then when the, t the time comes to execute the plan, I've got the resources. Mm -hmm. And the importance, I guess, in them staying connected is, as well can't sort of can't be denied. Also, that they need is just keep up those conversations with everyone around them and let them know how they're, it, yeah. how they're it feeling. It doesn't even need to be about their current situation. Just stay connected. Mm -hmm. um, I understand you probably don't want to tell everyone what's going on. You might have a select few: your GP, a health professional, and your best friend, or your mother, or your sister. I understand, but. What tends to happen in these relationships, Rachel, is that without even realizing these women find themselves very isolated mm. um, because they have a loss of self-esteem, self-worth. It's all, life is so difficult that they can't even actually deal with people. I'd rather just be left alone because I've got to navigate my way, way through this and feel safe that I can't deal and so they actually slowly start to isolate themselves, not to mention their partner also isolates them. Mm -hmm. So it puts them in position where they're losing friends because it's all about the control. Yes. So it makes it difficult for them to have friends. It makes them difficult to go out and have a coffee. It, you know, the partner doesn't want them to go to the gym and look great. So of course. really chip that, 
chips away at those opportunities for those women to feel good about themselves. Mm. But you do need to almost have a non-negotiable and some of the non-negotiables when you're in that position are, I will stay connected to at least three people all the time. Mm -hmm. It's non-negotiable. Pick three people that even, it doesn't matter how bad you feel, you commit to stay connected to them on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. One person know what's going on for you. One person you trust and give them and, and make a safety plan, whether that's, you know, the code word or if I ring you and say this, I need some help one person mm -hmm. speak to your GP if you're having some uh, physiology so obviously it affects our physiology being in a position like that speak to your GP about what you need and tell them about what's going on they are also mandatory reporters mm -hmm. which means if they feel that it's unsafe for you they will need to report that now I know that sounds scary but it is for your own good and probably the children in the home if you have them Mm -hmm. um, and the other non-negotiable is, is that at some point you will talk to a health professional and get some support. Now that might, you might not want to leave. You might not be ready. You might want to navigate your way through it, but the health professional will work out with you. What is the best plan for you? Yes. Um, so there's probably four non-negotiables there. Your contact, your um, making sure that one person knows about your situation, talking to your GP and getting hold of a, a health professional. Mm -hmm. And then using services like 1-800-RESPECT yeah. um, and yeah. White Ribbon that are really built, built to help, you know, people in that situation yeah. and help them through tough times as well. And in closing... And 24 hours a day, right? Yeah. You can call any time. Any time they're available. And sometimes that's a little bit easier because it's not so confrontational. You yeah. know, you don't, they don't know who you are on the other side. You don't have to feel any shame or guilt. You're ringing and saying, this is my situation. And obviously if it's an emergency call triple zero, um, but if you're feeling like you need to talk about something, call those numbers. Mm. <clears throat> the other thing I just wanted to mention, not, not all victims are, f are female. There are, no. you know, there is a percentage that it is flipped and that, that males are, um, the victim of abuse. Yeah. So can we just touch on this subject just before we sort of close off our chat today? This, was really, this is really, yeah, this is really interesting, Rachel, because it's men actually, it's so underreported for men. We talk about women um, not reporting incidents of domestic violence, but men do not report it. There is such a shame and a stigma around a man being controlled by a woman that they're actually ashamed. They're, they're like, and it's, some of them don't actually see it as domestic violence. So mm -hmm. I was talking to a gentleman a couple of weeks ago and he said, you know, this woman took all o over all of my emails, all of my social media. She made me close um, everything down, but she was allowed to have everything of hers running. She was allowed to be in contact with men. He was not allowed to speak to women. Um, she would throw him out of the house when they had a fight because she owned the house and he would have to get a hotel room. Um, and when, on, upon reflection, he, I said to him, you know, she had a lot of control over you. And he goes, yeah, yeah, she did. And I said, do you not recognize that as being in a domestic violent relationship? And he, he went, no. And I said, well, what would happen if you heard a woman went through that? He'd go, yeah, then I would. And I said, well, you've had exactly the same experience but you're just the man. Like, are you, did you get help? And he goes, no. He goes, how embarrassing. Why would I need help? Um, but he was left homeless. He was left with no money. And he was in a very similar situation that I, you know, hear a lot of women go through. Um, so it definitely does exist. And I think that's probably another topic that we need to be speaking about to make it okay for men to come out and say, hey, yeah. I need some help to this because Let's it's that again in another chat yeah yeah and that that's he was worried that when she started to physically assault him that because he was the man he was actually worried that if the police were caught it would be flipped and he would be seen as the perpetrator mm. um, because as he tried to like protect himself she had scratched herself or something so he was really scared um, about that. So, you know, men go through this all the time. Um, mm. It's just not reported or spoken about. 
Yeah, this is something I think we are definitely going to sort of um, sort of put under the microscope a lot more and and show our support yeah. for men also. I um, think so, and I think I think so. Yeah, what we what we do in domestic violence is that we spend so much time educating women how to get out, how to survive, how to um, notice the signs. But what we do really need to do is educate the men around you know domestic violence, what it looks like how to avoid it, how to be okay, empower women, help them. Um, so they're, they're, they're the other side of the coin. So let's help the women, let's help the men as well. Whether they're victims or perpetrators, there is an ability to recover from being a perpetrator. Mm. And as you were just mentioning, a lot of this is un, unreported, um, the abuse yeah. on men. So um, th there could be a lot more happening that, than we actually sort of know. But oh, um, yeah. 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 Well, look, you've given us some extremely insightful information today. Um, how would you summarise the key messages for anyone listening or watching? Um, probably um, domestic violence is a very real epidemic. Um, I know that we're going through a pandemic at the moment, but it really is. It's, it's, and it, it could be a silent one. It's one we don't see. Mm. It's one that we um, could be happening right next to us and we can't pick it. So um, I would say, it, you know, acknowledge that it's there. Um, be open around the conversation. Some people feel uncomfortable about having this conversation, but let's be open about it. No, mm. it, it's not. If we can't have these open and honest conversations about someone feeling uh, they are vulnerable in a relationship, we're not empowering them to make better decisions. We're keeping them in the place of being a victim. Mm -hmm. um, and let's be kind. Let's not judge. Let's be kind. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. If anyone's got any other questions and or want to reach out to you, whereabouts can they find you? Um, I'm quite active on my Instagram page. So I get quite a lot of DMs and I'm happy to message back. So that's doctor, um, at doctor.love, L-U-R-V-E. Um, and then there's my website, www.drlove.com. So any of those two, um, you can get me. Okay. Love the chat today and let's, let's have another one in the not too distant future. Take care. Yeah, do that. Thanks, Rachel. See you later. Bye.